Welcome to the ninth episode of the Mad Fuzzy Podcast. I am your host, Marta. This is a podcast all about knitting and spinning and hand dyeing yarn here in Knox, Maine, where I live with the amazing Betsy and my handsome man and our two wonderful dogs. Uh, see dog perching up there. Uh, she's going to have a cameo now that we've brought back the camera. And I have brought on a co-host for today. Hi, Betsy. Hi. <laughs> Hi, sweetie. So I'll let people know that this is a podcast that we try to get on the air every two weeks about uh, mostly knitting socks. Um, I would like to thank anyone who is a new viewer for stopping by. Welcome. And if you are a returning viewer, welcome back. Um, you can find me on Ravelry as Mad Fuzzy. You can find me on Instagram as at Mad Fuzzy. And you can email the podcast at madfuzzy at gmail.com. Um, so we were supposed to have an episode last weekend. And we had a giant storm up here in New England that kind of left most of the state of Maine without power. And we were not excluded from that. So we spent most of Tuesday and... Monday night in the dark and we did get power back after about 36 hours and so we did all right but we do have some neighbors that are still without power or getting power back even today so that's what took away the time to podcast as well as the power to podcast so we are here about a week late but excited to be back I've got some exciting knitting and Betsy's got some finished objects I do it's yes. going to be very exciting Yay. And uh, because knitting is a little bit light this week, we have a fun uh, run through of all the pickles we have made so far. The fall is kind of coming to an end. We're sliding into winter. And so this is kind of a rundown of what we managed to get put away. So um, I'll start it off with a little bit of administration. Sorry, Betsy. Ah, that's fine. Ah. Uh, so we've got an ongoing giveaway in the Ravelry group. That's the Mad Fuzzy Podcast Ravelry group. Um, there is a giveaway for the introductions thread. I wanted to meet and learn about all of you and what you're doing and your style of knitting and of course what kind of pets you have. Um, and you have been wonderful enough to stop by and leave an introduction in that thread. And when we hit 100 introductions, we are close to 70 now, uh, when we hit 100 introductions, I am giving away a skein of Mad Fuzzy yarn. And if you'd like to see that yarn, it is on the last episode, episode eight. So check that out. Um, but we'll get right into knitting. Um, so I'm going to start off Betsy with some finished objects. She's got some exciting finished objects. So. <clears throat> I do. I was one of the alpha knitters for uh, the Mad Fuzzy yarn, and <laughs> I was so happy to do it. Um, so I knit socks, of course. Um, and this is the pair... I, I've been watching. I've been watching these podcasts, and <laughs> yeah, I think. I'll help you out here, Betsy. All right. I so this one. this is the pair that I made from Mad Fuzzy Yarn. I think we're calling this colorway Tutti Fruity. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then the pink. I think we're calling it Code Pink because code I pink. spent the summer living at the Code Pink house down in D.C. So it's kind Oof. of in honor of the Code Pink ladies in the Code Pink house. Um, as I told the kids, I was moving to D.C. for the summer to live in a radical sorority house, and that's what I did. <laughs> you so. did. Um, so they are a traditional heel flap and gusset, and that's how you taught me how to knit. Yep. Um, you did the contrasting heels and toes because um, you were short on yarn. That's also why you did um, two separate socks. And um, she, she's the one who taught me all about that heel and toe yarn. And because Mad Fuzzy, the Pure Fuzzy base, is 100% wool, she did weave our knit in a show, especially on that Tutti Fruity. I think if you can see the... I'll get it right no, up no, in front of okay. the There you go. You can see the heel and toe yarn, which is just a nylon thread that um, adds to durability because I always think it's a shame to, to spend all the time knitting these beautiful socks and then have the heel and toe 
wear out on you too quickly. So, oh, these are gorgeous, Betsy. Yeah, I'm quite happy with them, and they fit nicely. And so I will now that I've shown them to you guys, I can start wearing them. Yes, you can. <laughs> All right, and I, you have actually, you've been rather prolific in the sock world. Uh, you've got another sock to show us well, as well. I have to tell the story of this. So um, we, I live in a little house that's heated with wood, and um, my bedroom is in the northwest corner, and it gets a little cold. And so I, during the winter, I wear bed socks. And this, I wanted to show you a pair that I've been wearing for a lot of years. This is actually yarn that my best friend gave to me many years ago, and I turned into nice... Um, bed socks which keep my tootsies warm in the cold Maine winter and so then a couple of Christmases ago I think it was yeah. a couple of Christmases ago. Marta was just beginning to do spinning and she spun me some wool and gave it to me for Christmas and so I made myself another pair of bed socks out of um, yarn that Marta had spun and dyed I hope you get and she'll tell you she'll tell you about the about the fiber so this is when I was really a beginning spinner um, so it's a pretty thick and thin single ply um, the wool I had gotten from uh, I think they give me like a sample pack of wool when I bought my Kromsky wheel and so it was just basics this was me learning how to spin and I dyed the roving myself um, so this was me also as a fledgling dyer and she made them into these gorgeous socks so I'll give you that back there which <clears throat> are too big to go under my work boots, but are going to be just perfect to keep my toes warm this winter in my cold bed. Yes. Awesome. Very Yay. nice. Yay! Yay! So I don't have any finished objects. I'm, I guess I'm a bad kid now. <laughs> I have <laughs> no. a lot of things. I've gotten very far on a very select few things. So um, I was taking my Romanian friend to the airport. She was going back to Romania for two and a half months. And so I brought a project to the, for the drive down to Boston, and um, I started these socks. And so you've never seen these viewers of the podcast. These are brand new to you. So this is a crazy zabber ball. Um, it's a German commercial sock yarn. Um, I believe I got this at Fancy Tiger Crafts in Denver. Um, we were there for a hand tool event for Lee Nielsen Tool Works, and I, I asked if I could go to a yarn store. And so I bought this. Um, and then never knit it up. It's one of my oldest stash. And so I did the Hermione's Everyday Sock Pattern. Um, nice long cuff. I did a heel flap and gusset as the pattern calls for. And I got to use the garter ridge <laughs> in pattern for once instead of on everything. And I did the Eye of Partridge heel as well. But I'm so happy with the, how these turned out. I think they're just absolutely gorgeous. They look so good on oh, the like screen them. with yep. the gradient. <clears throat> yep. So I got that done. And then this is what I've just been crazy knitting on for kind of monogamously for the last couple of weeks. So I am, I am on the second sock. I am past the heel turn. I am almost to my toe decreases. She has pretty tiny feet. So these are going to be a very late after Christmas. She's not coming home till January. Um, so these are going to be a very late Christmas present for her. Um, but I'm getting them done so I can take these needles and cast something else on. <laughs> um, probably socks for my mother for Christmas. But that's one of the major motiva motivations to get them off yeah. the needles is to get those socks on because those actually are for Christmas. So that is my, my hoe. I have um, made quite a bit of progress on my scrappy sock. So I showed this on the podcast last uh, week. This is my scrappy sock. And so all of these are individual scraps of yarn. I tied them all together in a magic knot cake. Um, and I have cruised right along on the other one. I'm almost to where I have to do another fish lips kiss heel. Um, and so I'm just waiting for a good night to sit down with the instructions and do another one. But it appears that Marta Madden has gotten pretty lazy. Oh, so the, no, other, no. <laughs> the other one, all the stripes are so small and perfect. But I was like, I need to get this ball done. This is taking forever. I've tied so many knots at this point that I appear to have gotten a little bit wider stripes on the second sock. So they're not going to be a match set. I am only human and they'll still be definitely beautiful. not perfect. So um, those are my scrappy socks and I will keep working on that. I do just need a good night to sit down and do that. Um, my last 
work in progress. I only have one other work in progress and that that's the end of the knitting. So um, I had cast on that um, Zodiac colorway from one Lupin that I had hand balled. There it is again. Uh, this is her Pemmican base. It's a merino nylon. It's so round and so plump. I am enjoying knitting with it so much. Um, and I have made what is called the Let It Shine sock. It's a free pattern on Ravelry. And it is this plain stockinette sock. And that's that colorway knitting up with this gorgeous lace panel that goes all the way down the front to the toe decreases. And so I am highly addicted to it. I've got the heel flap done. I'm going to turn the heel tonight. Look at the colors on the sock and the pooling that's happening. I'm just loving this stripe of blue and gold and then the flecks of pink in between. I love this colorway. I'm so glad I got it. This is probably going to be a Christmas gift for my aunt. But look at that gorgeous little cable pattern. It's such an easy pattern. It's just a four row repeat. Um, and it's like potato chip knitting. It really is the real potato chip knitting. Um, because you do stock and net for 90% of it and just these, like, they're really only seven stitches of this lace pattern. You get to it, you do the lace pattern, and then you go around again, you get to it, and you, the, the lace repeats go so fast because all you really realize is you're doing the lace and the mm. stock and net just goes. And holy crap, you're another row in, you're four rows in. And so these are just flying off my needles. I am having so much fun knitting them. So I believe, believe that has to do with all of the knitting. So I'm going to do a little bit of mad fuzzy news because there has been some mad yes. fuzzy news this week. Um, <clears throat> so mad fuzzy is my hand dyed yarn company, which it's even a little bit more than just a hand dyed yarn company. I select the fleeces. I select the farms. I buy this, these fleeces from. I take them to a mill, I tell the mill how I want them spun, and I get back Mad Fuzzy yarn. And so I have been dyeing it and creating this yarn for, I'd say about eight months now in the whole process. And I have finally decided that December 1st, I am going to do the grand opening on Etsy. I'm gonna open a small Etsy shop. I'm gonna have a really limited number of skeins. Uh, the first milling is really kind of a limited number of skeins. And so in order to get the second milling, I do need to get this first milling out into the world and see how people like it and whatnot. So I will be putting up most of what I have from the first milling as a limited edition first milling. Um, and so I need to get, get dying on that as well as all the little knit picky details like labels and, you know, uh, photographs. I have to get it into the Etsy shop ready to go live. Um, but December 1st is the deadline I am putting on myself. And so hopefully by December 1st, uh, Mad Fuzzy will be up on Etsy. I will be doing a big grand opening, probably podcast for it, showing all the colorways that are going to be in the shop, um, as well as what bases they're going to be on, because I do currently have two bases. One, Pure Fuzzy, uh, which is the 100% uh, East Frisian yarn. And then I've got um, a 80-20 nylon East Frisian blend, which is going to be tougher than anything. Oh my goodness, those socks are never going to wear out. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't quite settled on a name for that sock base yet, but those will be the two bases I have until my second milling, which I'm hoping to add a third and possibly a fourth. Um, so stay tuned for exciting new fibers from Mad Fuzzy. But I wanted to kind of show you where I'm at in my whole journey. So I had a friend design a label for me a while ago, and she did a wonderful job and I absolutely love this, but I managed to get a little mock-up of my label and put it on a skein of Mad Fuzzy yarn. So let's get it nice and focused here. So that is the label. And this is the yarn. Oh my goodness, this yarn looks great on this screen. <clears throat> it, the label looks so good on that particular colorway too. It's right? really nice. And so I did a little thing on the side. Um, our base is local. Mad Fuzzy is exciting sheep breeds, unique fibers, hard wearing yarns. From shepherd to shear, mill to dye pot, we keep it close to home. And that's going to be kind of my tagline. Um, but this is a skein I dyed for my mother's socks. I had said she had wanted to do um, a Mad Fuzzy skein and she really liked the idea of purples and grays. So this gorgeous beauty I'm calling Madame and it's going to be for my mother's Mercury socks, which I'll be casting on for the next episode. Um, I also managed to do a couple more little test dyes. Um, this one is a gorgeous um, blues and 
and browns and some kind of reddish rust. Um, and I haven't picked a name for this one yet, so I'm still, I'm still working on a name for this one. This one did not come out at all like I was planning, but I love it even more. So I have this little mini and I dyed up of it. And it's got this gorgeous purpley plum in it and these hot pinks, a little green. Oh, I'm just so in love with this one. And I'm calling this uh, Latin Beauty. So this is Latin Beauty. <laughs> and then, oh, lost my sock blockers. Uh, and then finally, this, I did this one, um, which is a lot of purples and pinks and some blue and some gray right there. And I am calling this one Punk Scene. And so <laughs> these are the first couple of skeins that I dyed. I'm going to do a lot more dyeing today and getting kind of a quantity of things to put up on the shop for December 1st and get those photographed and ready to go. There's still so, so much to do besides dyeing yarn. Um, but I'm so excited. I'm, I'm really hoping to be uh, up and running and doing regular updates and, and taking over your kitchen. <laughs> yes, yes, so that's all right. That's okay. Um, but that is really the end of all of the woolly talk and everything fuzzy. Um, so we are going to move into where well, we're going to clear off all the yarn stuff on the table and we're going to set up the pickles because there are a lot of pickles. Um, we have been very, very, very we busy. We have been industrious. <laughs> industrious. <laughs> and it doesn't hurt that I, I'll trade a produce vendor at market for some beef. And a lot of, a little beef is a lot of produce. Right. And she'll come home with these armloads of produce. And I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I'm making pickles today. <laughs> it literally is armloads, like trash bags of sweet peppers. Yes. Um, because it, it's really hard to get a veal chops worth of peppers if, <laughs> unless you buy by the pound. Um, so we're going to clear this table and we're going to come back and we'll do some pickle talk. Yay! Yay! Um, but if you are only here for the knitting and you have no interest in pickles, uh, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. It has been a pleasure speaking to you. I hope you enjoyed every little bit of it. Uh, we enjoyed sharing with you. If you did like this podcast, please do hit that thumbs up button down there. Let people know that this is a, a good podcast and that you recommend it and get us out there in the internet. And if you want to be uh, right up there when we release a new episode or anything else we might release in the next few months here pertaining to Mad Fuzzy and whatnot, uh, please subscribe to this channel. And if you are not already a member of our Ravelry group, please join that Ravelry group and uh, introduce yourself. Get that number to 100 so we can go ahead and draw that skein and send the first prize to the first person on the Mad Fuzzy podcast. So thanks again for watching. And uh, let's talk about some pickles. Oh, pickles, yes. All right. So Betsy and I have been extremely busy, um, Betsy mostly. That's why I brought her on the podcast to talk about all these pickles, because she has been quite industrious and pickled pretty much everything I have brought home. <laughs> um, a lot of people are intimidated by pickles. Um, I, they think it's a, a very difficult process, and it's actually very easy according to the ball jar packaging. It is a three-step process. The first step is to sanitize, which you boil your empty jars. The second step is to boil and make your brine. And the third step is to um, take the packed jars, which is your vegetables and your brine, and a lid, and reboil it, and that is the canning process. And usually you let that finished boil for how long? Well, it's called processing. That's your final processing. And, and that's after you've you boil not only the jars, but the lids and the bands, too. And I'll show you those in a minute. Um, and you process according to what it is you're canning and how big the jars are that you're canning. So it's usually it's 10 minutes for pints and 15 minutes for quarts after it's come to a full rolling boil. Excellent. So uh, we're going to show you what we pickled. We'll let you know the vegetable as well as what we used for the brine. Um, and I might try to do this in chronological order. <laughs> right? Okay. So the first thing I brought home was uh, 20 pounds of cucumbers. So um, this is your bread and butter pickle. Actually, I... No, uh, that's I'm mustard. Not, sorry, this is a mustard pickle. And tell us all about these mustard Well, so pickles. that's a sweet mustard pickle. And it, um, it's a kind of more traditional pickle because you boil the, the cukes and the other things and the brine all together. So you, you make 
you cut up your cukes. I, I think the other reason that people are intimidated by canning is it's a lot of work. I mean, it's a lot of processing. I mean, the process itself is simple. It's not rocket surgery, but but you still you still it takes a long time. As Marta learned one day when she was, we did some Skype pickling this summer. <laughs> While I was in D.C. and she was here. There's definitely on one of the previous episodes um, my woes of pickling bread and butters <laughs> and getting way over my head. Um, but those are left out because those are not Betsy right. pickles. And, and I've already talked about those. And, the, and you, you know, you don't start the pickling process at 9 o'clock at night is what don't Marta learned from that. O'clock. But anyhow, so these mustard pickles is you, you, you cut up the cukes and the onions and the peppers and whatever and you put them in the sauce and... And then the whole, and then you bring the cukes and the sauce to a bo- uh, just a boil, shut them off, can them into hot jars, and then process the jars uh, a quart for 15 minutes and a pint for 10 minutes. What makes them mustard pickles? They've got mustard seed and mustard um, powdered mustard in them, and mm-hmm. they're but they're a sweet mustard pickle. So we're kind of fond of the s- sweet end of the pickle. Uh, although we do make some dills, too. Yeah, we do. We do. Um, so then, I'll, because you mentioned dill, I'll bring out the dilly beans. We do dilly beans. I'll show you those gorgeous babies. And that's a brine that we use for a lot of different things. We make dilly beans. We make dilly fiddleheads. We make dilly dilly thing. You know, anything can be put in a dilly. And that's the process that Marta was talking about, where you pack the jars with the produce and then you boil the brine and pour the boiling brine over the packed jars and then put the lid and the band on and and process them pints for 10 minutes and I'm going to keep saying that because the processing is really important because that's what makes I'm going to dust this but that's what makes the lid seal you want to make sure that the lid is you hear them as they're sealing, as they're cooling, the lids go pop, 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 and you know you've established your seal, and that's what's going to um, preserve your food for March when you really want some beans. <laughs> yeah. So um, also with the, the dilly beans, we came, uh, I came home with a large bag of, of beets. <clears throat> and so we made pickled beets, um, and that's... Uh, that's a put the beets in the brine. I can't remember the process for this one. I think it's pack the beets in the jar and pour the brine over it. So process, the, yeah. The color of this is just yeah, phenomenal. it's beautiful. Um, it's just so bright pink in there. Uh, let's see. So, so tell us about oh. tell us about Dupont Circle. Right. So <laughs> while I was in in DC, I was working for a farming organization called the National Family Farm Coalition. Um, I was running their office for the summer, and but I really missed being around farmers, um, except for the ones that flew in to talk to their senators. So I would go to farmers markets almost every weekend, and my favorite was the Dupont Circle Farmers Market. It's beautiful, big, huge farmer's market with real farmers at it. I, I found that some of the farmer's markets in D.C. were mostly um, food ben- vendors, um, even the one at the USDA, which I found really interesting. Anyhow, so I went to the, <laughs> I went to the DuPont Circle uh, one, and this woman was doing um, p- different pickles, but the one that I absolutely fell, fell in love with was the one that she called her ballsy carrots, and it's a it's carrot sticks in balsamic vinegar, and she was getting seven bucks a jar for them. And I would take home a jar, and it would be gone in two days. So when I came home, Marta and I decided to try to recreate this. It's just everyone who's tried it thinks it's absolutely fabulous. They're amazing. <clears throat> They're absolutely amazing. Yeah. So I'm. I can't call them ballsy carrots because that's what she calls them. So I call them my Dupont Circle carrots, and uh, people are really, really enjoying them. So because we like the DuPont Circle juice so much. Yes, the sauce. The, yeah. the sauce, the brine. Um, I brought home a giant, what, five pound, maybe seven pound? Yeah, there were a lot. We still got lot. some left. <laughs> um, bag of little cherry peppers. And they're sweet peppers um, in a variety of ripenesses. Um, and so what do we do with these? We made, we made ballsy peppers, <clears throat> which is, again, packing the jars with the produce and bo- bringing the sauce to a boil and pouring it over um, and then processing for 10 minutes. 
Um, and we haven't tried these yet. No, we haven't. Because they have to sit, everything has to sit for two weeks. That's our most recent pickling. Yes. So that was, yeah, so that was, um, so those are still sitting and we're all waiting anxiously. I sent some home, my dad's birthday was this week, and I sent some home with he and mom, um, to, so they're going to be our alpha testers on that. Mm. So, yes. I'm, in, I'm intrigued to see what they say. What I they hope think. they're good. Yep. I hope I hope they're good. So that actually is the end of the things we have stuck in brine and pickled. Right. Um, you <clears> have <throat> been very busy as well. Um, so you have a small uh, grape Ar vine. Arbor. Ar I have a small grape arbor, yeah, on the side of the house. And so you made some grape jelly. The grape, uh, even with the drought this year, the grape um, harvest was the h biggest that it's ever been. <clears throat> and so I made grape jelly. Um, which I had never done before, and um, got almost a case yeah. of of, great, of jelly jars full of grape jelly, and actually kept a little out and tried it, and it's actually pretty good. Nice, yeah. very nice. Yeah. Uh, real <coughs> Shire grape jelly. That's right, 100% organic grape jelly. Used I used organic sugar and yeah, awesome. So, yeah, so. Um, Let's talk about your salsa. Yeah, so we um, actually, again, in spite of the drought, had a pretty good tomato crop this year. And so we were thinking of things we could do with it. And so I made um, uh, uh, something called Salsa Uno, which is nail sauce salsa. Um, it usually has radishes in it, but we didn't have any radishes. So it's nail sauce without the radishes um, out of an old Mexican cookbook that I have. And um, I add a little bit more vinegar to it so that we get the acidity down so that we can um, just uh, boiling water bath can it rather than pressure canning it because there is a, a problem with canning tomato-based um, products if you don't lower the pH enough. And there's back in the 70s when the whole Back to the Land movement was happening, um, the Back to the Landers kept giving themselves botulism poisoning <laughs> because they were trying to can well it was two things they were trying to hot water bath can tomato sauce and they were growing um, hybrid tomatoes which have that the acidity is not low low enough um, they were growing you know Heinz 57 variety tomatoes and those are specifically bred to have less acidity and so therefore they weren't um, there wasn't enough acidity in the sauce itself to kill the botulism off. So um, you have to be careful. We grow only heirloom tomatoes here at the Shire, and so all of our tomatoes have a low enough acidity that eat with a little bit of added vinegar, we do not have to worry about pressure canning them. But just to warn people that if you're canning with tomatoes out of the grocery store, they're not low enough acidity for you to not do pressure canning. Good to know. Just a little safety warning. <laughs> I do believe in food safety. Excellent. In spite of what you might hear about me. <laughs> so uh, another <clears throat> tomato-based um, canning project we did, um, and there are a lot of these. There are. My handsome son, the chef, although he calls himself a cook, makes a really good um, tomato sauce. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. And so the deal with him is he makes the sauce and I can it. So he made us almost a case worth of quarts of marinara sauce for us to use. And we've done it, we've uh, had, we've opened them a couple times already. We're not waiting for the winter. And it is, it's absolutely delicious. And we have more tomatoes in the freezer that when he has a minute, very busy man. <laughs> Both of these people working full-time jobs and trying to build a house. It's amazing that Marta gets a podcast out at all ever. So. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so, so that's our larder. That's our larder, unless we want to talk about kimchi or, or save that for another time. Um, let's talk about kimchi. Why right. not? Um, so, so we also, we not only pickle, but we uh, ferment things. So there is a difference between pickling and fermenting. Um, and you actually bought us a wonderful device to help us do so. Um, and so we are going to talk a little bit about our kimchi we've been making as well. And, uh, and... That's kind of part of our whole putting things away and, and eating well and eating local. So um, tell me about your kimchi. 
Well, so um, I work at a small um, seed worker-owned seed company, and one of my friends there said, I found this great kimchi maker. It makes it so easy. And so she said, and I've got Amazon Prime, so I'll order it for you, and the shipping will be free. Yeah. So Roberta Bailey, thank you very much, um, ordered me this wonderful um, kimchi maker. Let me set my kimchi down. Mm -hmm. And it has a gasket with a vent that goes down in it so you chop up all your thing you, you, know, you chop up your cabbage and and beets and whatever carrots and and you put in your sprinkle of salt and you keep going until you're almost full and then the gasket goes down on and i won't push that because mm -hmm. it'll break marta's hands so the gasket goes gets pushed down on top so it's right down firm and then this goes on and it latches and I gotta say, it's the slickest thing for making kimchi I have ever. Uh, the the actual uh, name of the company is Crazy Korean Cooking. So I'll link uh, to uh, Amazon in the show notes where you can find this. Yeah, it, it's it's great. So so this is our latest. We've had we've done two, three batches now, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. this is the third. This is the third batch, and this is um, beets and beet greens and cabbage and some onions Ooh. and some Ooh, garlic and again. yeah <laughs> um so yeah it's and it just i chop it up i put it in the kimchi maker with some salt i leave it on the sideboard i look at it once or twice a day and push oh, and this stuff is so good it's so good mm. so crunchy so salty mm. It's good for you, too. And the lactic acid is really good for your digestive system. Mm. You just feel good eating it. A little effervescence. Mm. So, yeah, and, and I just have just a little side note about our fermentation here. We, you can't see them, but we've got three carboys of cider fermenting on our, on our sideboard here because we did a big cider pressing and... Um, and that's there. And then I did a cider pressing the other day that will become vinegar yeah. in our crock because I have a vinegar mother that I'm going to add to the cider. And we'll have, in six months, we'll have our own homemade vinegar. So, yeah. We do, we ferment a lot of things around here. Yes, we do. Yeah. Yes, we do. Yeah. And so that's, that concludes that whole thing. I did want to kind of give you a little small life update, uh, let you know kind of where we were at. Um, so, let me look at my notes here, let's see, I haven't even looked at this at all. Um, so we've got, we've got a kitten. <laughs> yeah. Blind Willie Johnson. <laughs> Blind Willie Johnson. She, uh, her eyes never opened. And so, um, she's our little special needs kitten. She's so cute. Um, I'm excited to see her get a little bit bigger and more rambunctious, yeah. uh, despite being blind. So that's been a lot of work. Um, the mother cat is being really, really good with her. I have to say, she's a very young mother cat, but she's being she's being a very good mother. Good. Yes, yeah. um, and so we have a, a little kitten at the Shire. Um, the house is moving along um, slowly but surely. Uh, it's getting a little colder here. We're lucky enough to be having kind of a long fall, so um, it's not yet snowed. Thank goodness, and it doesn't sound like it's going to snow too much anytime soon. Uh, today is a very gray and rainy day. I'm watching the rain come down outside the windows. Um, and that's kind of really where we are at the house and not too much progress. We did get all the windows in, but not much more than I reported on last week. Um, we're getting ready at Springdale Farm for Harvest Fest up in Bangor. That's a big, big event, probably our biggest event of the year. We get a booth up at Harvest Fest at the Cross Insurance Center. And it's just a big marketplace of main made products basically uh, a lot of people do a lot of their christmas shopping there and so we sell a lot of beef we sell a lot of veal and we sell a lot of cheese so we've been prepping for that um and with the power outage that affected so many um markets have been slow and our cheese production has been slow so it's been a kind of a weird week some weird hours <clears throat> um and next week's going to be equally as busy because it is next Saturday and Sunday in Bangor on the 11th and 12th of November. And uh, yeah, we'll be there vending away. And other than that, I, uh, I got Betsy hooked on Sex in the City like a decade <laughs> late. Um, I know now it's, uh, it's retro TV, but she's, 
She's falling in love with Carrie and Miranda and <laughs> Charlotte and Mr. Big. Just like just like a brand new viewer. Um, I can't wait to show her the movies and whatnot. There's so much sex in the city out there for her to consume. Um, so that's what we've been <laughs> watching together and knitting. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much life here at the Shire. Yeah. Not too much else exciting happening. Um, I guess I'll leave this kind of short because this episode might be kind of long with all that pickle talk. It might. Um, but thank you for sticking through the pickle talk, and I hope you are inspired to do some kind of pickling of your very own. Uh, it is fun, it is enjoyable, and you always have something to give a house guest or um, to open for a impromptu snack. So thank you again for watching. If you did like the episode, thumbs up. Please subscribe. Join the Ravelry group. And, of course, Enjoy your knitting. Bye.